the human body is not meant to make that many amino acids from plant foods. It just can't do it efficiently. There's a reason when the athletes go vegan, they get injured within three, four, five, six months. Every single time they get injured, it's because their body is simply not making the proteins, the amino acids required to build tissue. Hey guys, today our guest is Frank Tufano. Frank Tufano is on a nutrient-dense animal foods for more than seven years and has expertise on nutrition, exercise, and well-being. He has a very famous YouTube channel called Frank Tufano with over 100,000 subscribers with around 20 million views. He's also the author of the book The Ancestral Indigenous Diet, which is based upon the forgotten wisdom of our carnivorous past. In that book, Frank teaches us a traditional way of eating that allows us to achieve weight loss, longevity, overall health, and most importantly, happiness. I really feel that Frank is one of the torchbearers in dispelling the myths associated with food and nutrition. I'm really, really happy to welcome the daring and dashing Frank Tufano. Hey, Frankie boy, thanks for coming to the show. No, thank you. I'm looking forward to sharing some health information that will hopefully help a bunch of people out. Before we go into the questions, can you share where can people find you, Frank? Yeah, sure. YouTube, Frank Tufano. That's my most popular social media platform. And if you go to frank-tufano.com, that's T-U-F-A-N-O, it, it's basically a compiled, nice little like screen of all my links. So you can check out my YouTube channel, my other social media, whether it's Twitter, Instagram. You can check out my meat company. We have Frankie Strange Meat. Frankie's Strange Foods, Frankie's Naturals, as well as Organ Supplements, which we're actually, uh, we're trying to get back up and running. But it's helping people find high quality animal foods. And you can also find, you know, the Carnivore Chorus, my book, all that stuff on there. But by all means, you know, there's thousands of hours of information to go through on my YouTube channel. Thank you, Frank. Frank, my first question is, how did you discover the carnivore diet? So back in i mean this this was a couple of years before i started youtube probably between 2012 and 2013 i was having health and digestive issues after taking a pharmaceutical drug called accutane which is basically very high levels of retinol vitamin a and i couldn't really digest anything and i felt like crap all day and i had no energy and i basically googled like how to be healthy because I was I was bodybuilding at the time and I was well I stopped working out but I was still following a bodybuilding style diet because I thought that was healthy and I wasn't feeling good on it so I figured it wasn't healthy I discovered a book uh, and I don't I don't really like uh, mentioning people mainly because you know they have their own interests and you have to kind of read between the lines and make sure you know you're not getting deceived at all but but for the most part these people pointed me in the right direction. Uh, Paul Check's book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. And uh, Norga Gaddis had a book, Primal Body, Primal Mind. Um, those books turned me on to a, a book, Weston Price, Nutrition and Physical De Degeneration. And the, the books are great. The information in them is, is very helpful. It can get you started. I actually did reach out to each of these groups of people individually for either interviews or to be associated with them. And <laughs> didn't. let's just say it didn't work out. But those books gave me the idea that, okay, well, you need to get certain nutrients from animal foods. And when I started that diet, when I incorporated the elements of each of those books, I ended up doing what I would consider keto paleo. And that was because, you know, Paul Check's book advocated for like a paleo style diet almost. Norga Gaddis was more of a keto with some vegetables here and there. And then Weston Price's book, had the nutrient density of the animal foods, but it, it didn't really go specifically into what you should be doing. It just gave examples of indigenous diets. So I kind of went on my own to explore it. There's definitely a few elements that, you know, I've emphasized more in the, in the past year that are definitely key to health, but t taking those, you know, the information from those three books at face value and then doing experiments, testing it out for a couple of years, I then started YouTube after seeing what worked for me. Thanks, uh, Frank, for sharing that. Uh, Frank, you always say that food quality is king. Can you explain that? Yeah, so a lot of 
what we do in our lifestyles can be broken down into negative and positive. And primarily, people are suffering from a lack of nutrition as well as too many negative agrochemicals and, and components in their food. So when you consume a quality food, your goal is essentially either to get vitamins, minerals, elements of fatty acids, you know, some nutritional component in your diet, or like the caloric energy, which you know you could also consider caloric energy nutrition, but it's a little different. It's for survival. It's for you know exercising, just fat stores, whatever it may be. You know that's the main goal of humans is to survive. So whether you're going for that nutrition or for that caloric energy, you need to make sure that the food is clean from herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, insecticides. The animals weren't injected with too many antibiotics. There's minimal problems with their lifestyle. So once you remove those negative components, and each of those could cause problems on a, you know, you can address them subjectively, whether it's um, the, you know, like an herbicide called atrazine can cause estrogen metabolites to be in the tissue of the meat that can disrupt your own endocrine system. There's people that follow, you know, a feedlot carnivore diet. And the reason a lot of them have to use testosterone and steroids is because of the crappy meat they're eating. I've had many clients go from, uh, and even just a standard American diet has a lot of endocrine disruptors, estrogen, you know, testosterone levels usually triple or quadruple as soon as you increase the food quality of your diet. Uh, and then you have just a bunch of other things causing oxidative stress uh, that, that your body needs to process. And overall, really just damaging your digestive system, damaging your immune system, imbalancing nutrients, lots of oxidative and metabolic stress. Again, you could talk about how a high calcium content can cause dysfunction in certain tissue. You can talk about how high omega-6 linoleic acid causes dysfunction, but that's about removing the negative component. Uh, and then most importantly, once you remove that negative component, then you can focus on incorporating the positive, which isn't as big of a deal as people like to think of it. Usually when people try to be healthy, follow a good diet or do this or do that. They're focused more on doing good things as opposed to removing bad things. So when people think they can just, oh, eat all these high quality nutrient dense foods and then not worry about, you know, getting enough sun or, or making sure the food is actually, you know, what the, the butcher says it is. If you can remove those negative aspects from your lifestyle, you will benefit far more than incorporating um, just pure, like nutritious, very high vitamin foods, but th that nutrient composition definitely needs to be understood to be healthy. Thank you, Frank. Frank, what should one remember when cooking meat? The main concern people have when cooking meat is that there's a nutrient loss and, and there's a fairly big community, raw primal diet especially, that focuses on consuming raw meats. Now, to be clear, every single group of indigenous people consumed both raw, cooked, and fermented meats. So, you know, there's no only raw group. There, you know, there's the inherent benefit of raw meat is that it's it's in a natural state where your body's enzymes and cells want to use the tissue from that meat in itself. Whereas when you cook the meat, it's using it more for caloric thermal energy. Uh, it's using it more to feed the gut bacteria, you know, the fungus and the bacteria in your gut like eating the cooked meat more. And especially in colder climates, if you notice in the wintertime, you can't really follow a raw diet because you get very cold very quickly. And there's a, there's a cooked component to food that humans really need. It increases the caloric density. It feeds your gut bacteria. And, you know, when you, when you have just specifically raw meat, Yes, it can be healing to people that have been eating cooked diets for 10, 15, 20 years. And many people do find that they feel a lot better on that raw diet. But once you understand why you're eating those raw foods, you can address the specific components in your lifestyle that cause you to feel better when eating raw, whether that be that it has a higher vitamin C content, then maybe you want to incorporate some type of whole foods, vitamin C supplements in your diet. It could be that you're lacking digestive enzymes, so then you might want to take a digestive enzyme supplement and see how you feel doing that. And usually people even just overconsume cooked food, so you could just be eating too much food for your digestive system when you cook it. Uh, from an actual nutrient loss, it, you know, when you cook the proteins, they are harder on digestion. They do require more enzymes. 
So you certainly stress the organs that need to produce those enzymes, small intestine and the pancreas. The B vitamin, C vitamin, fat soluble vitamin loss when cooking the meat isn't really that excessive. The nutrient loss is not a concern. It's more about how it's being digested in your body, how much it's stressing your enzymes. Are you, you know, consuming too much cooked protein and, and overfeeding your gut bacteria? Do you need more raw meats in your diet? But but for the most part, a pretty good principle is, you know, around, you know, 40% diet cooked, 40% diet raw, 20% fermented is is a pretty good baseline to start with for, for most people. And that, and that fermented meat component is something people typically miss. Thank you, Frank. Frank, what do you say to the people who say that uh, no one diet is suitable for everyone? If you were to try to name a diet that would work for someone, you could say a tribal diet. Now, people don't really talk about tribal diets because it's very difficult to understand what those people ate because they all eat so many different foods. You know, you can go to one part of the world and they're eating fish, shellfish, seafood, and maybe they're eating a lot of coconut and tropical fruit. You can go to another part of the world and they're just eating like dairy and bread and, and meat. So the, the main, we, we can break up the tribal diets into two components, the animal foods and the, the plant foods. The, you have a lot of the nutrition, most of the nutrition in the animal foods, the protein, the B vitamins, a lot of the fat soluble vitamins, some of the minerals. And in the plant food component, you have other minerals that aren't really found in high amounts in animal foods, and then you have a lot of caloric energy. So once you look at how every tribal group of people had a similar, you know, once you isolate the vitamins, the minerals, the fatty acids, you know, the, the paper values of what foods they were consuming, you can see, okay, now we know what nutrients we need to get. So if you take that tribal diet base, you understand what nutrients occur in that tribal diet, then you can apply that to other diets and see if they're missing something. And, it, and it's, it's a lot, I mean, yes, it takes, you know, a lot of hours of understanding of, of nutrition. And when we mean tribal diets, we basically mean any sort of indigenous group of people. Most are probably familiar with Native Americans. Imagine like, you know, hunter gatherers foraging for, for food. And there are still a lot of people now in, obviously outside of America that still follow very close to their indigenous dietary roots. Frank, what are your thoughts on fruit? Fruit, I mean, fruit is a pretty interesting discussion because from, from a logical outside perspective, there's obviously an accessibility concern. Uh, you know, fruit are, are very, very seasonal. They don't occur in large amounts in nature. Uh, that being said, even when you do have access to fruit, it's typically not very calorically dense. It, it does have, some fruits have a pretty good, Fruits are mostly glucose and fructose. Sometimes they have sucrose, and uh, it doesn't di uh, sucrose doesn't digest that well. Um, so you know, if you have a pear or an app, or like sometimes pears are very high, and you eat them and they don't digest that well, and even then they're not that calorically dense. Uh, something like tropical fruit, like pineapple. I mean, grape uh, grapes have a good glucose to fructose ratio. So when when you look at the nutrition of the fruit on paper, hey, it has some B vitamins, it has vitamin C. Uh, not really a crazy amount of vitamin C, and that it's probably offset by the carbohydrate content because you know you need vitamin C to metabolize sugar. So that's kind of a net net loss there. Uh, and again, since the caloric energy isn't that high, you know what are you doing when you're consuming the glucose and the fructose from the fruit? You're feeding your gut bacteria. Uh, you know humans don't have the same enzymes that like monkeys and chimps do to metabolize fructose. So it's meant to make us fat. It, it doesn't appear that these indigenous groups really had access to or consumed large amounts of fruit. Uh, do I think fruit can be incorporated into a healthy diet? There's certainly some fruits that have like anti-nutrient concerns and not, not specific, not what people, most people call anti-nutrients. Um, some do have oxalates, which, which are an anti-nutrient, but we also mean like the flavonoids, flavanones, carotene, the stuff that gives these fruits their color uh, can actually inhibit liver function and cause digestive issues in a lot of people. So you can't exactly, you know, don't expect to feel good eating half a pound of blueberries per day because that's something that's very unnatural. Maybe you could do that for like a week or two at a time to replicate how they would have, you know, been harvested in nature. Uh, again, you have to go by how you feel. I think apples, pears, grapes are, are good fruits for people to start with. See how you feel. See how that works from a carbohydrate perspective. Um, but 
you know, there's a reason those indigenous groups and those tribal people were typically eating starches and grains for more of their calories, or they chose to get caloric energy from animal fats. Thank you, Frank. Frank, what do you think about plant-based bodybuilders? I think that they're a bunch of liars. I mean, mo most, most influencers are a bunch of liars, but like, how much are you going to lie? Like, it's, it's getting ridiculous. Like, I, you have a lot of these, you know, these fake natties that it's like, you know, people believe them. No, fake natty, listen, they, they live the gym lifestyle, they bodybuild, they take steroids, they pretend they're not. But then you have these vegan bodybuilders, and you're like, okay, how much are these guys lying about? They're, uh, they're, there's no other, v it's more apparent because, you know, there are some reasonably muscular natural bodybuilders. But the vegans, it's funny because every single vegan is like, you know, they're skinny fat, they have very low muscle mass, they don't, they're, you know, they're frail, they're like zombie-like. And I mean, compared to the stand, average standards in America, and some vegans do look better, but the difference between, you know, a vegan and a vegan bodybuilder is like night and day. It, it's, they are literally every natural vegan that works out, like why aren't all of these, you know, why aren't all, there are a bunch of muscular vegans running around in the gym like there are a bunch of muscular regular people. There's a reason. We don't have the animal protein in the diet. You can't build muscle. We don't have cholesterol in the diet. Your body can't synthesize the hormones, the testosterone needed to build muscle. And when these vegan bodybuilders inject testosterone, they're literally offsetting the negatives of the vegan diet. And, and who knows if they're telling the truth about being vegan because, you know, if, if you're a carnivore and you eat plant foods and you cheat, it's not like you're a vegan and you're eating steak and you're getting nutrients that aren't contained in the diet. So th they're damaging people's health in a sense that th they're creating a false image and misleading people. Yes, other, a lot of other influencers are lying to people, are misleading people, but not on as large of a scale as these vegan bodybuilders. And, and, mo and they don't even have to look good. Most, of them, and most, most athletes that use steroids, they don't look like they're on steroids. They might not be the most amazing athlete. Some of them might not even work out. And a lot of vegans probably do take testosterone that don't work out just to offset the negatives of the vegan diet. Thank you, Frank. Frank, what do you think the early humans approach to eating organs? There's definitely an accessibility and survival aspect to organs and meat and what foods that these indigenous people ate. Uh, a good book to read about this is The Fat of the Land by Vilyamar Stephenson. And they had very, very specific preferences when it came to consuming each animal. Uh, there was a preference for fat because fat is very calorically dense. They need it for survival. It can replace carbohydrate energy. So usually the fattier parts of the animal were preferred over, over other parts. And now we have these, you know, when, when you have conventional animals, they're a lot fatter than wild animals used to be. So when they used to hunt, you know, the wild sheep, the wild venison, whatever animal it was, They'd have to pick out like rib sections, belly, tail, head, certain parts that had a high caloric energy. You know, if you look at the Alaskans when they were hunting these animals that had a lot of blubber, they had a specific ratio of, of fat to protein that they would eat. And since these indigenous people were consuming so many of their calories from animal protein and animal fat already, it wasn't usually needed to consume large amounts of organs they typically split up the organs between certain members of the tribe. So one example of this could be the elders would each get a piece of the animal brain. Uh, the, the pregnant woman would be fed fish roe or the ovaries of the animal. Uh, they, they fed specific organs to specific humans at different stages of life. I remember the Eskimos would feed the kidneys to the children. They, they knew the nutrition properties of each part of the animal and then they, they would feed and, and nourish themselves correspondingly. Usually the woman, the fertility, the children, they needed more nutrients at certain stages of life. Uh, there is definitely belief in certain glands, um, you know, like when they harvested the adrenal glands from the which are on top of the kidneys of the animal, some tribes would cut up the adrenal glands into equal portions for every single member and each of them would have a bite. So there's definitely an element of sharing but overall, when these people had unlimited access, again, big preference for fat, for, for caloric survival, and, and they would also ferment a lot of, a lot of the meat.
They would let it sit for months, months, maybe even up to a year at a time, which changes the bacterial profile and also the nutrient profile. And, and there's a lot of benefits to that. And not and the main reason the carnivore diet isn't really that successful in the modern world is because of abandoning the fermented aspect. Thank you, Frank. Frank, what is your opinion on plant-derived proteins? I mean, so, soy, wheat, all that, all that, all those plant protein powders. I, I did a video recently explaining uh, uric acid cycle and amino acid metabolism, and and the body basically, it's very, very, very stressful to to make certain amino acids. And it, when when you look at the input and the output of those cycles in the body to process amino acids. There's no way that by take like on paper you could argue okay well it, this looks good but there's so many other metabolic impairments from not having cholesterol from not having certain amino acids in the diet if if they were able to make and I mentioned this in that video if they were able to make synthetic forms of certain amino acids then it's possible that by putting those into the diet it would work better but even then there there there's chemical aspects of those powders that are probably impairing absorption you're stressing your your metabolic processes so much that it, you're you know the function of the urea cycle is not just to to manufacture let, let's put it this way the human body is not meant to make that many amino acids from plant foods it just can't do it efficiently there's a reason when the athletes go vegan, they get injured within three, four, five, six months. Every single time they get injured, it's because their body is simply not making the proteins, the amino acids required to build tissue. You know, you could you could write down B vitamins on a piece of paper and chew that piece of paper and eat it. That's basically what they're doing by consuming these plant protein powders. It's been proven anecdotally, and when you look at a metabolic perspective of the pathways. You can understand why, okay, well, if the diet's deficient in saturated fat, if the diet's deficient in these amino acids, it's just not going to work. Thank you, Frank. Frank, everyone in the nutritional world is obsessed with antioxidants. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, a couple, I mean, maybe even over six months back now, I did, I did a, it was kind of like a two-part series. It was like, what is inflammation and what is antioxidants? Because people are always wondering you know, what causes inflammation in the body and then what are antioxidants? And I mean, I don't have a great memory, but I did a very in-depth video on this. You have antioxidant cycles and the chief ones are a glutathione cycle, which is basically uh, methylation, which is run by B vitamins. You have the vitamin C cycle, which is run by ascorbic acid. And then you have the vitamin E cycle, which is tocopherols. So if you're able to optimize those cycles and then remove negative lifestyle factors, that would maximize antioxidant capacity. And all that really involves is making sure your digestion is adequate so you're absorbing B vitamins correctly, making sure you're taking a whole foods vitamin C supplement, and making sure that you're not consuming too many oxidized fats so that your vitamin E levels are not stressed. And in addition to, I'm gonna, as soon as I can somehow get, uh, I'm trying to get materials to make it now, I'm gonna make an antioxidant supplement, there are certain um, compounds you can take like B vitamins and amino acids that are specific to those antioxidant cycles that do, do stimulate them. So my supplement, for instance, has, it's going to have glutathione, it's going to have N-acetylcysteine uh, as well as vitamin C and something else. So uh, w once you realize what nutrients run, what cycles in the body, you could kind of take them for a boost in a sense. Frank, what is the role of electrolytes in a carnivore diet? So most people are having some type of health issue and usually when they ask a question, people rush to them saying, oh, it's electrolytes, electrolytes, electrolytes. All minerals are antagonistic. I actually still have my, this is a little ridiculous. I have my, I'm not gonna show that actually, but I did, I, did a, I did a mineral wheel video with a whiteboard and you have, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Point, you have 10, 15 minerals, very simply, off the bat, that are all antagonistic and synergistic with each other. So when people say, oh, take electrolytes, take electrolytes, take electrolytes, you know, when you douse your body with potassium, you're, you know, you're countering magnesium, you're countering a bunch of other minerals. 
So when people take electrolyte supplements, they tend to throw other other uh, minerals out of whack. And if you have an understanding of what electrolytes your body needs, what people are typically deficient in, what your actual health problem is, then you're probably not going to be taking electrolytes. You're probably going to be taking a vitamin D supplement. You're probably going to be trying to consume certain foods in the diet. You're going to be addressing certain lifestyle factors. A lot of the times, electrolytes can kind of blanket uh, underlying issues. Are, are some people not consuming enough salt? Maybe. Are some people not consuming enough potassium? Usually unlikely, because if you're eating a lot of meat, food in general has, has a decent amount of potassium. Uh, but, but by all means, you know, people, people can try taking a potassium supplement. Usually they don't notice anything. Uh, adding a little bit more salt to the food, sometimes people notice a difference. Uh, but again, increasing the food quality, balancing nutrients, developing understanding of overall health, which, which does take a while. It's not, it's not just one. That's a very small component of diet to try to blanket a bunch of problems with. Frank, what is your opinion on fake meat? Beyond me, all, all this type of stuff, it, it just seems like a way to, it, they're doing it to get people sick. It's definitely part of like the, the new agenda nonsense to try to replace meat and get people to think it's healthy or whatever. But it's essentially repurposed agrochemical poison, uh, like they've shoved grains and seed oils and plant-based crap down our throat for the past 10, 20, 30, 40 years. They're always trying to repurpose that stuff in the form of the vegan diet, in the form of the, the, these plant-based burger patties. Um, the, the, the fake meat almost, you know, I mean, yeah, you could talk all day about how it's bad for you and how there's chemicals in it and how it's processed crap, how it tastes and smells and looks like poison. But this gets more into the political aspect of what they're trying to do with these big companies, why there's so much money behind them, what the end goal is, and, and it's, it, it's not looking good. Um, they, you know, they, it does seem like, the, obviously, they don't want small farmers, they don't want people producing high-quality food, they're, they want to damage the population in some way. That, that fake meat stuff seems to be a pretty big component of that. Frank, what is your opinion on Mediterranean diet? So they, uh, by, by Google definition, Mediterranean diet is vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and healthy fats, weekly amounts of fish, poultry, beans, and eggs, moderate portions of dairy products, and limited intake of, of red meat. So is it actually Mediterranean diet, or are they turning it into some plant-based nonsense? Uh, you know, Mediterranean people uh, actually consume uh, uh, the same amount of meat that Americans do. So roughly... 30% of the diet of both Mediterranean and standard American people is composed of animal products. So what the mainstream media tries to do is they try to take a healthy group of people that are consuming plenty of meat, fish, eggs, and dairy, and they try to paint it as, oh, no, it's, it's the plant foods in their diet that are actually healthy. But there's no mention of you know buying organic or higher quality plant foods that don't have agrochemicals. There's no mention that those people are living in Wi-Fi free areas that are low in radiation. You know, there's no mention of the quality of the animal products those people are consuming, like really raw, high quality sheep and goat dairy, wild caught fish. They're raising the animals in their backyards. The food quality of the Mediterranean diet in those areas is what makes it healthy. It's not those foods inherently. Thank you, Frank. Frank, do you think there is any relation between genes and hair loss? So, so let's, let's clarify. When people say genetics, what people are actually saying is the environmental and lifestyle factors given to me have resulted in this. And it, it, it does, by, when you mean genes, you say, okay, well, over the past two, three generations, my family's diet has been this, therefore I look like this. So it's not, although it's mostly, you know, were you breastfed? What were you fed as a child? how much radiation was in your environment growing up. Those are the main determining factors of your development. If your parents were also in a compromised environment, if your grandparents were in a compromised environment, and we see this in Pottinger's Cats, it's talked about in Weston Price's book, degeneration after several you know, families and families, uh, you know, several hundred years of poor nutrition have long-term ill effects. So in regards to hair loss, It's, it's usually just 100% environmental factors. So hypothetically, if you were able to optimize the diet, the nutrition, the lifestyle since the person was a child, they're not going to lose their hair. But 
oxidative stress, inflammation, nutrient imbalance, I think a very high percentage of men have baldness. That's probably very, very high. I think it's probably 60 to 80 percent. I wouldn't be surprised if the majority of men lose their hair at a relatively young age. Frank, what is your opinion on 5G? So people are, are acting crazy about well, they should be acting crazy about it because it's basically being set up to monitor and control the entire population. But even just the radiation before 5G was very, very bad. Even the current radiation without 5G is already harmful enough. That's why the Amish are so much healthier. The Amish are a group of people that live without electricity. They, well, they don't. They have electricity, but they don't have Wi-Fi. They don't use internet. They uh, they don't drive cars. They use horse and buggy. They're in much lower radiation environments. They're much healthier. 5G is like a step up from people are already getting sick. People are getting cancer. A lot of most modern health problems, especially in a lot of my clients, have been because of radiation exposure. So just the current modern 4G cell phone use, internet, Wi-Fi is already a problem. 5G is going to take it to the level where we're going to see even, I mean, listen, listen. Kids are already getting cancer. Babies are already getting cancer. Everyone's very unhealthy and, and things, a lot of people with fatigue problems. Now with these 5G towers getting set up and high radiation areas, I mean, you're hearing stories of people vomiting on the street. You're hearing stories of birds dropping dead. They, they went from killing people slowly with radiation to having basically military weaponry that can make people sick within a matter of days. Radiation, and if you look up, symptoms of radiation poisoning, they're basically identical to the current, uh, you know, what's going on in the world right now. Frank, what EMF protection measures do you take? Yeah, you can buy uh, protect. Well, mo well, there, there's a couple steps to this. I'm actually looking at starting a, uh, a, a clothing company to, to sell the products at an affordable price, because if you go online and you try to buy t-shirts and underwear uh, that can protect your organs, usually it'll cost you like 80 bucks for a t-shirt, 40 bucks for underwear. So I'm trying to make stuff that I can get people more affordably. Um, you know, protecting your head is kind of unrealistic. You have to wear something on your head and it impairs your vision. It's kind of difficult. Uh, but but during the day in, in high Wi-Fi environments, if you're forced to work somewhere, the underwear and the T-shirt that you can wear over your regular undergarments to keep them clean is something you can do. That's a, that's a fairly minimal investment. Um, uh, you can buy a bed canopy to sleep in, which is usually four or five, six hundred dollars, which is made with a special fabric that can block all Wi-Fi frequencies to sleep in. I have a video where I built my own Faraday cage, which is a bit cheaper, but more involved yourself. You know, probably cost you 100, 200 bucks, depending on what materials you use. So by doing these, those two things, the protective clothing and the, the Faraday cage, you re effectively reduce EMF by about 60 to 80% in your lifestyle, which is enough for most people to be healthy. Uh, overall, there's a checklist. So you, you obviously want to turn all electronics off at night all Wi-Fi devices off at night, router, cell phone, everything. But when people live in an apartment, when people are, have family members that want to use Wi-Fi, it's usually very difficult for people to completely turn Wi-Fi off themselves. Um, if you're able to turn everything off at night, then the next step is you want to hardwire as many devices as possible. You hardwire your laptop, turn off the Wi-Fi. You can even hardwire your cell phone to some degree. Um, you know, Maybe when you use your cell phone, it depends on how crazy you want to get with reducing the Wi-Fi EMF. But once you're able, if you're able to turn off all Wi-Fi devices, Amazon devices, Wi-Fi emitting devices, turn your cell phone off at night, keep it on airplane mode as much as possible throughout the day and check it intermittently, um, you know, even relocating to an area that's a lower frequency. Um, there's ways you can shield rooms. You could buy wallpaper. You could, I got to, I can sell, I might sell wallpaper too. I'll try to get some. You can basically make the room a metal box. Uh, there's a bunch of ways you can shield yourself. It's usually several hundred dollars worth of investment, time, and know-how. And depending on whether you're in an apartment, whether you're in a high Wi-Fi area, or, you know, I, a lot of my clients are in, in an apartment situation and they're, they're strapped for cash, which makes it difficult because usually the apartment costs more to, to, to shield. And then a lot, of, and then sometimes there are people who are living out in the middle of nowhere and all they have is an internet. We're out of that they just turn off at night and they're, they're pretty good. So it really depends on your individual living situation, but it's a large enough component of health that it's it's the biggest component of health that you should invest in first if you want to be be feel better about about just in general everything. Thank you, Frank. Frank, now we have, now we have questions from subscribers. Tim is asking, 
Why did early humans die young if they are healthy? The average age, well, first of all, who's who's taking those statistics? Everyone in charge is a bunch of liars, so I wouldn't take... I did a video on this answering this. And if you take it at face value, a lot of them died young from famine and starvation. Uh, a lot of them, these tribal people, I mean, they were savages. If if one year the baby, if one year there was bad harvest, they would kill the babies and feed, literally feed the babies to their other children. They're cannibals. Um, so survival as humans was very difficult uh, from from a caloric procurement perspective. But once once the once the child once they got past childhood and and that early life, they usually lived to 70, 80 years old, and that was basically to the point where they would be able to. Fun, fun, and if you look at tribes now, 80, 90, 100, very, very popular in the Maasai, those people, they live very, very, very old. Uh, I mean, Italians have a very, or Italians are known for living a very long time into their hundreds, eating, you know, the Mediterranean style style diets um, that, that our ancestors consume similar diets. So these people live very, very long lives if they can survive um past childhood. And the, and the reason it's difficult to survive past childhood is because the nutrients needed for development and pregnancy and fertility, and, and then to raise a child for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you know, there's no guarantee, there's no guarantee that for three, four, five years, the harvest is going to be good. You know, once a child is six or seven or eight years old, they're there, they can, I mean, it's, it's, it sounds crazy to the average person that a six, seven year old child is, might be starving themselves, but Back in the past, that was kind of reality. And even now, I mean, you could say kids aren't being starved, but they're being starved with nutrients. They're getting a lot of calories and, and crap, but they're not actually getting the, the substances they need to grow. So that, that, that aspect of nutrition during early stages of life up until about 18 years of age is, is something that we don't have now that our ancestors kept, so, kept very close to them. So important that as I said, there's, there's stories if they had a two or three year old and they gave birth one year and they didn't think they would have enough food, you know, they would feed the ba the young baby to the, the older, the slightly older child for nutrition. Thank you, Frank. Frank, uh, Laura is asking, what is your take on probiotics? The gut microbiome is pretty complicated. Uh, your gut's supposed to be composed of different groups of bacteria and usually the reason your gut microbiome is messed up is because there's some sort of dysfunction, whether you're not producing enough enzymes, you have some liver damage. Um, very rarely will probiotics in themselves solve the problem. If they were to solve the problem, the, the only real foods that have an ideal probiotic profile tend to be very high quality raw fermented dairy products like kefir and yogurt, certain strains of those dairy products are okay. That being said, a lot of people don't tolerate dairy, so it can be hard to incorporate probiotics. Um, and usually when you do incorporate probiotics, you have to kind of, you have to wipe out the bad bacteria first. So at face value, taking one or two probiotic pills is so far from understanding what you need to do to take a probiotic. And you got to address, okay, well, well the, my first question to that person is, okay, why do you think you need probiotics? Have you tried these foods? Have you tried those foods? What's your past dietary history? Usually when people are looking at addressing their individual health on, on the basis of this or that, or they heard about probiotics, or they heard about vitamin D supplements, it's a matter of addressing the entire lifestyle and fixing everything and then, and then seeing, seeing how their gut or their issues are corrected. Thank you, Frank. Frank, Nestor Jen is asking, will you ship organ supplements and warrior bars to India if the shipping charges are paid for? Yeah, no, we ship everywhere on, I mean, organ supplements. We've had a little bit of a hiccup for a couple months. Uh, I should be getting in product this month and I'll be, I'll be producing everything myself. But as soon as, soon as everything's produced, hopefully sometime by mid-November, we ship internationally, we ship everywhere. I haven't had too many. I might have shipped to India a handful of times. I do get more like UK orders, like Germany, um, Ireland. I get a lot of orders from Netherlands, Finland, that type of stuff too. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, international shipping 
if you pay it, we can ship it. Usually, if you order like a small thing, first class is usually pretty affordable. But sometimes it, it still goes up to 30, 40 bucks. And it's not a crazy amount for shipping, but you know, the cost of living and the, and the currency conversion in some countries like India can be difficult. But I, I try to make the supplement, I, I sell the supplements for lower price uh, than, than other people. Um, so if, if you don't have access to the supplement in your native country, then by all means, you can purchase from me. I'm sure if you're in India, you might have uh, a lot of luck going to like a local butcher or like a live slaughterhouse and asking them if you can buy the glands from them. They'd probably be happy to sell you like fresh raw glands for a better price than I can ship them over there to you for. Thank you, Frank. Frank, Carly is asking, what are your thoughts on China study? Let me just put, let me just pull up a summary just so people have the context. China could... The China study examines the link between consumption of animal products and chronic illnesses such as coronary heart disease, diabetes, breast cancer, prostate cancer, bowel cancer. The author concludes that people who eat a predominantly whole food vegan diet, avoiding animal products, will escape, reduce, or reverse development of numerous diseases. So a lot of cherry-picking data in this. Um, the, the one example I like giving, which is really simple, is everyone who's lived to 100 was not vegan. You know, people, Maasai, indigenous groups eat tons and tons and tons and tons of meat, animal products. Some of them, like people in America, they, they eat meat, they get sick. People in Africa, they eat meat, they're healthy. It's, it's obviously, and then you look at what is meat. It's, it's a natural food from nature. Generally speaking, if a food occurs in nature and you eat it, it, it if it's like calorically dense, it, it's usually not bad for you. Yeah, there's like poisonous herbs and stuff and that and that type of po- uh, stuff that's obviously poison. But if it's in nature and it tastes good, it's usually good for you. That's usually that's how it, that's how nutrition kind of works. And you know, modern conventional meats definitely have downsides. You know, if you did a study on people eating conventional beef, pork, or chicken versus someone following a vegan diet, you might be, that, that some of that information is correct. If you take modern dairy products which have a lot of estrogen, a lot of endocrine disruptors. They mess up your hormones. The modern dairy products are full of so many chemicals. They're fortified with vitamins and they, vitamin A, which can, the palmitate and, and the forms they put in them can damage your liver. The modern, the modern animal foods are poison. So if they're, if they're looking at people that are consuming, you know, crappy animal foods and on a crappy diet in a high radiation environment, of course they're going to find problems. So, we we can look at studies and look and and even even going actually into like the physical numeric values used in those studies it's relative risk and when they say a study has a relative risk of like if it's below two or three the study should be thrown out but most nutritional epidemiology is like a 1.1 1.2 because there, there's not much variation in in the dietary because people don't have much variance in their diet in general So when you look at the relative risk between comparing different diets and lifestyles, since both of the diets kind of suck, the relative risk never goes that high. There are a handful of studies where we see very high relative risk. Uh, I think it was called the India Railway Study, where the relative risk for the Indians that were consuming the grains and the seed oils was like six or seven compared to the, the Indians consuming like dairy and ghee and butter products. So There are there are legitimate nutritional studies that have a high relative risk that have been comparing like a, a standard diet to basically a tribal diet, but those are very few and far between. And and most of the data is just manipulated and twisted to to create an agenda. Again, but again, the 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 numeric values in these studies that are being used, it's just it's it's always to, to push an agenda. And I've never really used a study to And I've never used a study in that way. I've never said, oh, well, the relative risk shows that you're going to get heart disease. No, I say, okay, well, what's the mechanism? What's What happens in your body when you do something? You know, a lot of the studies I look at, it's like, okay, well, what happens it, What happens to your liver when you consume copper? It, it moves iron. If you can look at mechanisms and understand how the body uses and does certain things in a study, that's what's very, very helpful, understanding what enzymes your body uses to digest proteins and how much of those enzymes you need is going to be far more helpful than 
a study saying, oh, well, these people that ate red meat have colon cancer. Like, okay, well, why? What's in the meat? What's happening in the body? What's going on? The study should not be used to, to blanket and generalize things like they're using them. Frank, final question. Would you like to issue a seven day challenge to our subscribers? A seven day challenge. I guess I would say if you can follow a diet with a clean slate. So if you can buy just basically quality meat, quality carbohydrate foods, whether it's, you know, organic rice, organic pasta, organic fruit, if you can eat, you know, decent quality beef, maybe some wild caught fish here and there with like a healthy grains as your source of carbohydrate energy, some fruits, maybe some vegetables thrown in here or there. If you're able to remove as many chemicals as possible, I would say turn that cell phone off at night and then maybe try to get to the park once or twice this week. You should notice a drastic difference in your lifestyle. And once you actually feel that difference, then you can take steps towards making it a permanent lifestyle change. Frank, uh, can you once again share where can people connect with you? Yeah, sure. If you go to frank-stefano.com, there's a link to all of my social media, um, all of my, you know, my meat company, my businesses, all that type of stuff. You can check it out. And obviously the biggest component is my YouTube channel. So you can just search Frank Stefano on YouTube or you can go through the link on my website. And then I have, I think I have close to a thousand videos now, um, you know, some are covering health topics, some are purely educational. Sometimes we make fun of vegans, we expose the downsides of the vegan diet. And more recently, we have some fitness stuff. So, you know, you could spend hours and hours and hours and hours going through all of that information. Uh, if you want a brief summary, you know, I suggest either the carnivore diet course I have on my website, the book I did, as well as, I mean, worst case scenario, if you really want me to spell it out for you, you could just reach out to me for a consultation. Frank, before we leave the interview, I just want to share with the audience how I got benefited from you. So before starting the carnivore diet, I was like having so many doubts regarding how to cook meat and like so many electrolyte issues and everything. And I was searching on the Google and I was talking with many people, but I was still confused at the core. So after that, uh, as I always watch your videos, in one video you mentioned that you made a course. So I have took the carnivore course and it was just like uh, 40 minutes or something, but I totally understood every single thing about carnivore diet and I implemented it with ease. And uh, now uh, I have lost more than 60 pounds and I can say that uh, you are one of the main uh, pillar in my diet. <laughs> Thank you very much for your knowledge. Hey, I'm glad things are working. Yeah, that, that carnivore course, it, it's basically about an hour just explaining, okay, these are the very basics of the carnivore diet. This is how you get started. And I kind of point out which videos I've done to explain things further. So if you are interested in a carnivore diet, if you want to understand what things you might have to supplement um, because you're not consuming plant foods, that's definitely one thing you can check out. I do have, I do, I mean, I have shorter videos on my YouTube channel that also outline that if you just search like how to get started on a carnivore diet, usually in my meal videos, I also explain bits and pieces here and there. So you spend an hour or two, you should learn enough to get started. Thank you once again, Frank, for coming to the show and helping us uh, become more healthy. No, thanks. I had fun. I enjoyed this and uh, I'll continue to pump out some content on my channel every week, but there's definitely a lot for people to go through right now. And guys, make sure to subscribe to BNS Goku Great.